Alaska at the northernmost tip of America, 1,530,700 square kilometers, encompassing more than one half of the protected lands of the United States, making this country's 49th state a natural paradise. of the boreal climate has kept man away from most of this territory, converting it into a gigantic natural inheritance on the last frontier of the civilized world. Alaska is divided into three large regions, the mountains of the Pacific along the southern coast, the central plains and plateaus bathed by the Yukon River, and the northern slope or Arctic zone, a land of ice, cold and tundra. The climatic conditions of the extreme north are very harsh. The summers have no nighttime, they are cool and short, while the winters are long, dark and very cold. For eight months of the year, the average temperatures are below zero degrees centigrade. These regions are the domain of the tundra, a word taken from the Finnish turturi, which means treeless plain. Under the surface layer, the subsoil remains frozen all year long. This permafrost precludes the development of trees, and the only vegetation supported are small creeping plants low-growing shrubs, herbaceous plants, mosses, and lichen. Further inland, the change in vegetation marks the border between the tundra and the conifers of the taiga forest. This is a transitional strip of land where many of the tree species are shrub-sized due to the tense conditions under which they develop while the shrubs, lichen and mossen of the tundra persist. The tundra's harsh winter climate has also forced the animals inhabiting the region to develop survival strategies, and the species must choose from three alternatives. They either migrate to avoid the winter, hide themselves away until the warm weather arrives, or confront the climate openly with special physiological adaptions. Musk deer fall within the last group. They have short legs, sturdy bodies, and a layer of thick, long hair, which minimizes the loss of body heat. They also have a subcutaneous fat layer, which builds up during the summer months and is used as an energy reserve during the long winter season. Musk deer are so well insulated from the cold that any excessive effort, such as running, causes their body temperature to rise and forces them to stop and pant to cool themselves down. As a consequence, their instinctive response to a threat is to group themselves in a tight circle with the calves in the center and the adults with their anteladen heads facing outward. Musk deer's adaptive strategy allows it to colonize new tundra territories easily so that their reintroduction into northern Alaska has been a complete success and their semi-domesticated herds today multiply freely.
Other mammals prefer to migrate from the tundra inland, where they are more protected when the winter arrives. Caribou are an example. These animals, known to zoologists as the world's greatest walkers, breed in proximity to the Beaufort Sea in the Arctic Ocean and migrate inland to the taiga forest with the arrival of the winter season. The taiga offers refuge to fauna during the winter months. Even so, the cold is intense until the thaw in late spring. But unlike the tundra, there is no permafrost to impede the development of trees, which protect the plants and animals from the icy winds. The taiga, or southern tundra, is composed of conifer forests, mainly pines, firs, spruces and larches, which are able to withstand the duration and severity of the winters. The undergrowth in the taiga is poor because the trees do not allow much light to get through and the soil is covered with snow for most of the year. The soil has a high level of acidity which is increased by the decomposition of the conifer aciculae and the dominant vegetation includes most lichen and different species of equista. The arrival of the thaw is the beginning of a period of abundance. The animals come out of their winter lethargy, there are new pastures for herbivores to graze on, and the entire community finds food easily. Spring is also the time when many animals bring their young into the world. Some, such as the caribou, migrate from the taiga to the northern tundra, while others, such as the wapiti, remain under the shelter of the conifer forest, taking advantage of the explosion of vegetable matter to replenish the fat lost during the winter. In early June, Alaskan rivers are the scene of the arrival of different species of salmon, thousands of which return from their stay in the ocean to spawn and die in the waters where they were born. Bald eagles know this and they lay their annual broods during this period when there is abundant fish to feed their offspring. The bald eagle or white-headed eagle is a very common bird in Alaska, which contains the largest number of nests of this bird on the American continent. Unfortunately, it is rarely or infrequently seen in any other state because hunting, pesticides, and the loss of natural habitats have diminished the population. The white-headed eagles build their nests near the rivers to be near the food source for their young. Five species of salmon swim upstream in the rivers of Alaska in late spring, and their arrival is followed by that of the great grizzly bears, which are eager to replenish the fat loss during the winter. On the shores and banks of the rivers where the bears catch the salmon and devour them, thousands of skeletons and some scattered excrement bear witness to the fishing incursions of these plantigrades which are easy to observe during this period when they leave the depths of the forest to meander along the shores.
Alaska is a land of bears. There are between 4,000 and 6,000 polar bears, more than 50,000 black bears, and between 35,000 and 45,000 brown bears, which, although they belong to the same species as the European brown bear, are larger in America. Here in Alaska, the subspecies known as the Kodiak bear is the largest of them all, an animal which can grow as tall as four meters and weigh up to 1,200 kilos. Alaskan parks and reserves include areas where hunting is allowed. On Kodiak Island, for example, recreational hunters shoot some 150 brown bears each year, providing income which is used for the maintenance and care of the reserve. The growing attraction of this final frontier attracts more hunters every year, and the wild animal populations depend on careful and responsible hunting management. Yes, I believe so. The areas that are easily accessible by road, uh, the game populations are definitely down. But the remote, uh, the real remote areas, there's still lots of game out there. The trophies are harder to come by, naturally, because there's more pressure. But there's, uh, the game department has set aside some areas for trophy hunting only, and the minimum size, uh, like in a moose, some of the areas have a 50-inch minimum spread, and the sheep horns now for all hunters have gone up basically from three-quarter curl to full curl. So the animals taken now are more mature in lots of respects than they used to be. The only uh, deviation to that would be in subsistence hunting, where there, in many cases, you're allowed to take uh, cows or bulls or the smaller animals. But the main thrust in hunting is uh, the trophies are larger. Game management is very essential. If, as long as we can keep it out of politics and keep it in the hands of professional uh, sportsmen, hunters, and subsistence users, and uh, game biologists who are really concerned about the game populations, yes, it's very, very practical. The conifer forest marks the distribution area of the elk, the largest member of the deer family. In the summer, they feed on the bark and young branches of trees and on the aquatic vegetation found in the many lagoons peppering the taiga. Their long legs ending in wide hooves with separate toes, which allow them to walk on the snow in winter, now help them to walk through these waterlogged areas. Like so many other animals, the elk also have their offspring in the warm season. Among elk, normally solitary, the strongest social bond is that between a mother and her offspring. During the six months from birth to weaning, the mother is a jealous guardian and does not tolerate the presence of any animal, even of the same species, around her young. The anger of these jealous mothers frightens away other elk, but their offspring on the contrary, very sociable and curious, will follow any other animal that comes near them, which can be a problem for a young male whose only desire is to feed peacefully on the river weed in the pond. All 
All along the southern coast and on their northern slope or Arctic zone, the taiga and tundra alternate with great mountain ranges whose peaks rise up to a height of 6,194 meters at Mount McKinley, the highest point in North America. The mountain ecosystem has its own particular species. It is a steep, rugged world where the animals have had to adapt in order to live amongst the rocks. The chamois of the Rockies and the doll sheep are the maximum expression of this life in permanent equilibrium. From birth, doll sheep learn to live on the mountain. The females give birth in the middle of May on a rugged hillside and the young males are scattered along the middle of the mountainside while the larger males, more distrustful and suspicious, live together at higher levels. For walking on the rocks, the doll sheep have hooves which are especially designed for climbing. With their weight supported on their legs, the two halves of the hoof separate until the sharp edge is steadied against the unevenness of the rocks. On the bottom they have a pad which facilitates traction and prevents them from slipping on very smooth or wet rocks, thereby allowing them to colonize even the steepest peaks. The mountains play an important role in the water cycle and therefore in the gradual transformation of the landscape. The waters flowing down from the peaks are the result of the annual rainfall which comes in the form of snow during most of the year. The snow falling onto the peaks is deposited in glacial valleys as it accumulates, it is transformed into ice and begins its descent, at which time the glacial tongues peppering the Alaskan orography are formed. The glaciers are living structures in perpetual motion. The ice from these glaciers may move anywhere from a few meters per year up to 50 or 60 meters a day. The movement causes strong tension which erodes the landscape and fragments the glacial tongue from which great blocks of ice break off. Permanent erosion of these powerful frozen masses slowly but inexorably changes the topology of the landscape. The fjords on the southern coast of Alaska are striking testimony to this sculpting force. Most geologists believe that the fjords were formed by the action of the glaciers which cut deep valleys into the shore, which were later filled with water when the sea level rose. In the beginning, many fjords were the river estuaries, which were made deeper by the glaciers. The fjords are the maximum expression of the richness and variety of Alaska's wild nature. Their nutrient-rich waters support the development of an ecological pyramid where whales and porpoises, salmon, otters and seals 
live together in a delicate ecological balance. Unfortunately, the fjords are another example of the risk to which Alaska's virgin nature is exposed as a result of man's industrial activity. When in 1867, the North American Secretary of State, William H. Seward, negotiated the purchase of Alaska from the Russians for $7,200,000, people called this land Seward's Madness. Today, this madness produces six billion barrels of oil, which is transported through the Alaskan pipeline from Prudhoe Bay to the port of Valdez, where the first oil tanker put into port in July of 1977. It did not take long for the flourishing oil industry to show its negative potential. On the 24th of March 1989, the Exxon Valdez, a theoretically safe oil tanker, ran aground in Prince William Sound, dumping 35,000 tons of crude, which reached as far as 900 kilometers away, killing the fjord's wildlife, including 3,500 otters, 350,000 seafowl, and millions of fish and aquatic invertebrates. Today, almost 10 years later, life has returned to the fjords and the fishing industry, more ecological and traditional than the oil industry, is once again reaping the fruits of these waters. But many years will be necessary for recovering the ecosystem's natural richness. The fishing and forest industry are the two pillars of the state's economy, which are directly dependent on nature. Several fishing villages in the fjords live on the salmon they fish, and therefore on the ecological health of the water and marine birds. It was only thanks to government assistance that they were able to survive the years following the Exxon Valdez tragedy, and even today, they note that the ecosystem has not fully recovered. When the base of the ecological chain is damaged, the entire system suffers the consequences. The most visible animals, such as fish or fowl, return gradually. But without the bases of the food pyramid, their populations decrease, and the animals are weaker and less developed. Alaska is privileged to have a low population density. It's more than one and a half million square kilometers are home to a population of about one million inhabitants, of whom 8% are Eskimos, 6% are Merry Indians, and 2% are Lutes. It is therefore one of the last virgin territories where nature is still seen in its wild state. But it is a fragile paradise floating amidst a great oil reserve making its future dependent on man carrying out the correct actions. It will be necessary for an understanding and appreciation of the incalculable ecological value of this land to take precedence over quick economic profits in order for Alaska to continue as the final frontier for future generations.